All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Thursday. I think it's the fifth week of the semester. I'm Dr. Mary Kinmiyu Danico, Director of the Michi and Walter Weglin Endowed Chair for Multicultural Studies. It is my distinct honor and a privilege to welcome Sikani Robinson, um, ABD PhD candidate, home back to Cal Poly Pomona. Um, such a thrill. I've known Sikani forever. She graduated in 2016, but I've known her, I think, since her, I don't know, freshman or sophomore years. And um, she is really a rising scholar in the field of sociology of work, sociology of body, um, sociology of sports. And when you think about uh, a person that I would hope that you, uh, you would look up to as a, as a scholar that you can cite um, and refer to and invite as guests would be Connie Robinson. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Sikani. As I mentioned, she received her undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona in the Department of Sociology back in 2016. She's currently at uh, UCSB in the Sociology Department. And I will turn off the ring as soon as I'm talking. I don't know if you can all hear the ring or not. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit of the bio because she's been doing so much work since she left here. Um, what's not on the webpage at Santa Barbara is that she was featured in Missy Copeland's Apple TV documentary series because she is really the first pioneering black sociologist and sociologists in general to look at black ballet dancers and dancers, um, not just the dancers themselves, but all the players within that industry. And I think she is going to be a major force in the field and will be cited quite often. When you think about her work right now, she's looking at the intersection of race, gender, culture, and embodiment. And specifically, she um, is looking at Black women in ballet. When she was an undergrad, she did, still did work about Black um, athletes, in particular cheerleaders at that time. And so her work is just kind of expanded and flourished beyond that. I think the foundation of her work is based on the notion of aesthetics and emotional labor and elites. And so it's really challenging and contesting the, the notion of you know, who is a ballet dancer, you know, in our industry and really positioning black ba ballet dancers at the center of her discourse, which is really important. She's received numerous awards and accolades from the American Sociological Association. She received the Sociology of Culture COVID-19 Crisis Grant Award. She received Santa Barbara's Sociology Flat Fund and the Study of Democratic Possibilities Award. She received the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport Barbara Brown Outstanding Student Paper Recipient Award. She also has a paper forthcoming, um, and I can't remember exactly what publication, but I did read the paper because she was kind enough to send it to me before. Um, and she is currently, one of the exciting things she just shared with us at Santa Barbara, will be curating an art show of all the different photographs and photographs that she's collected of uh, ba Black ballet dancers, and it's gonna be forthcoming. And so, I know I've said a lot, but can you imagine she's only been a, a, in the PhD program for the last five years and the amount of work that she has accomplished as well as her continued engagement with the community. I mean, she is very much in touch with the dance industry. So with that, I want to welcome Sikani Robinson. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, well, I first want to thank Dr. Danico for inviting me and the Wakeland um, Endowment, Daniela and Kelly. Thank you um, for all your help and work and communication. So I'm going to share my screen and we will get started. Alrighty, so Today I'm going to be talking, it comes a lot out of my article, which it will be out in sometime in March. We're finishing up the publications as we speak. But today I'll be talking about this added racialized labor that Black ballet dancers experience. So while we have emotional and aesthetic labor, which I will explain as we go through it, there's this added racialized labor that Black women um, have to embody while they're in this predominantly white elite industry. So before I even get started, I know ballet is such a niche um, activity. I wanted to give you a very, very brief history. Um, it, 
of the basis of ballet, just to give you an idea of where we're going in the direction. So ballet has, a, of course, been historically known as a predominantly white elite activity, and it started in Italy around the late 14th, early 15th century. But during that time, it was kind of, it wasn't the ballet that we see today. It was more so of like a court dance. So like cotillions or debutante balls, if you all are kind of have an idea of that, like ballroom dance. And it was solely for aristocrats. Um, so it was one of those activities where they got together and just kind of had these balls. As they moved, as ballet then transitioned through to France in the 16th century under the reign of King Louis XIV, he ended up falling in love with ballet. And that's when we started to see the ballet that we see today. They started to codify a lot of the balletic terms and the basic five positions that we that is still used and heavily val uh, valued in ballet still till this day. Also around, so at, throughout that time, around the aligning with the French Revolution in the 1800s, eight, 1850s, ballet then started to, they called this the Romantic Ballet era. And what happened around this time, we started seeing ballet shift to, of course, the ballets that we see today, but they started to tell this story. And as they were telling this story, it still, it still had connections to this aristocratic ideology and um, storyline. So that's kind of, and it aligns with Disney movies. So, or we start seeing like the fairy tales or we see these mythical creatures. That's what we started to see in France during this time. After that, ballet started to shift all around the world. And another place it went was to Russia. So around 1689, that's when um, ballet really started to take off in Russia. And then you had this iconic choreographer, Marcus Petipa. He created the ballets that I'm sure if you know anything about ballet, about ballet, you know of these ballets. So you have Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, which is a big one, and the Nutcracker. And the Nutcracker is very significant because it's considered one of the more racially insensitive ballets. So every time around Christmas time, but it's one of the most iconic ballets. And around Christmas time, you always kind of start hearing the conversations about ballet. I mean, about the Nutcracker, they're always shown. It's one of those family friendly ballets. But now we're starting to see where people are calling out um, a lot of companies that still perform the, again, the racially insensitive ways in which the Nutcracker is performed. So blackface, yellow face, a lot of times the, there are like racially uh, caricatures that are not properly, um, it's not a proper depiction of the cultures in which they are sharing within the ballet. And one thing that was really significant about the Nutcracker is that majority, almost every participant that I spoke with or interacted with shared an experience while they were performing the Nutcracker. It's one of those that everyone performs when you dance in ballet, but everyone had a story about it. So moving to the 1900s is around the time when ballet then started to really shift and break ground in the United States. And so um, actually in the early 1900s, a lot of black studios started to be created because of course black people couldn't enter into these other spaces. So um, W.E. Du Bois actually was a big supporter of trying to get these ballets go, I mean, get these black schools going. Um, relating back to his talented 10th, he wanted black people to be be able to understand these aristocratic cultural activities. And so he was a big supporter in trying to get these ballet schools. Now, of course, as a lot of history is told, um, it's typically told from a white lens. And so a lot of these things are not shared and hidden. So it took a long time for us to start getting this timeline of Black um, the importance in the history and the influence that a lot of Black dancers have. You have Catherine Dunham, which she is a big big um, influence on dance in general, dance in the United States, but she also had an influence in ballet. But of course, those stories aren't told. So when you, um, for a lot of historical stories, they start around in the United States, it starts around the 1930s with George Balanchine, who they coined one of the creators of American ballet. Um, along with Anthony Tudor. And so George Balanchine um, and Lincoln Kirsten created what is now considered the School of American Ballet, as well as New York City Ballet. And then in 1939, American Ballet Theater was created. And I highlight those two because those are considered um, some of the most um, widely known ballets in the United States. But of course, there are so many more, particularly um, Dance Theater of Harlem, 
is another big one that also competes, but is not always put in the category. So this kind of gets into my journey into where I started. So in 2017, this article came out calling out those same companies, New York City Ballet, as well as American Ballet Theater asking where are all the black dancers. And so this is, uh, when I saw this article, I saw it a little later, but this kind of went into me thinking about, well, you're right, where are these black dancers? Cause growing up, I knew of one and she was retired and I, it was so hard for me to really find much about her. And Miss T Copeland came on a little later on um, towards the end of my, my dance career. And so this, um, so when this article came out, I started, this is kind of what influenced me to go into my, uh, going to grad school and write my dissertation on black ballet dancers because I wanted to know where are they? And then I wanted to know, okay, well, what are their experiences? So that's what I actually went into uh, my, uh, my thesis, actually looking at the experiences of black dancers. And as I started meeting with them and interviewing them, one thing that was kind of, uh, that really jumped out to me is when they talked about the emotional labor that they put in, the emotional labor, and then trying to navigate this aesthetic labor that's so heavily placed on ballet dancers. But for Black women, there was, again, this racialized labor that they added because ballet is known as this Eurocentric um, activity and it upholds these Eurocentric ideas of beauty. And so at this point, they're trying to navigate a space that they know is not for them. And that's kind of what I wanted to hone in on. I wanted to figure out, okay, well, how are we dealing with these two? And then when I looked at literature, a lot of times we weren't talking about emotional and aesthetic labor together. They were typically talked about as separate things and they didn't hit that intersectionality of race and gender. A lot of times it was solely gendered. Um, and so that's kind of where I felt like this was my avenue to uh, start to write my thesis and my article that's coming out. That's what I wanted to explore. So what is emotional labor? So emotional labor um, came from Arlie Horschild. I really hope I said her name right. I feel like anytime I ask people, they say it differently, but um, that's where it was coined. And it's the management of feeling to create a publicly observable facial and bodily display. So I, the way I like to break it down is when you're working in customer service and you either have come in and you had such a bad day or the person you're speaking with is it's kind of hard they're being difficult but you still have to try and find a way to please them put on this happy face despite how you're actually feeling this is this emotional labor that you're bringing in and again for a lot especially um, how Horschild kind of presents it she presents it more of a gendered thing. Um, but you also have Milan Kang and uh, Dia Harvey Wingfield that kind of bring a racialized perspective to it, but there's still not much literature on that. And so connecting to emotional labor, um, what's Warhurst and Nixon then kind of coined aesthetic labor. And aesthetic labor looks at the styles and the way you need to look within a certain um, occupation. So I think the best way to think about it is who gets to work at Hooters and the look that they have at Hooters or Hollister or Abercrombie and Fitch, which is an interesting one because they have a lot of discrimination cases that happen because they because of this aesthetic labor that they try and um, put on their employers or urban outfitters. So this is essentially this aesthetic labor that is happening, trying to uphold and look a certain way while you're at your job. You have these strict limitations. Of course, discrimination comes in to it very heavily. So that's all umbrella under aesthetic labor. So um, getting into this, these numbers, uh, oh, so, and so essentially what I'm trying to do is talk about this emotional and aesthetic labor. It's this mind body thing that, especially for a lot of black, um, professionals, they don't get to separate. A lot of times one affects the other and that's what I wanted to really make sure I honed in on and shared throughout this presentation and throughout this research. Now I want to show you the numbers. And so we talk about there's not too many black ballet dancers in these professional companies. This is what I'm talking about. But I do want to quickly make this side note, Dance Theater of Harlem is still considered a very elite ballet company. But of course, like I said, because ballet is always seen and talked about through whiteness in a white, in a white lens, they don't always highlight it as a one of these top companies. And so as I went through this, I followed um, the numbers that, uh, 
Another article has published Lauren Brown in which we look at the, these, these com top companies that are then highlighted in articles. I kind of did it off that way. I kind of picked regionally, the top companies regionally. And as you can see, less than 5% of, of these ballet dancers are black women. Lauren Brown looks at it in 2007, and she is able to find only eight ballet dancers out of the 446 that she composed of throughout the United States were Black dancers, and only one was a Black woman. In 2015, she did the same research, and she found 22 Black dancers out of a number of over 500, and only seven of those 22 were Black women. So this also explains why I focus on Black women. The numbers for Black women are way less than um, black men. And a lot of times that's where we get into that stigma, the stigmas of how black women are portrayed, which I will touch on as we continue. And then sometimes these negative stereotypes and stigmas that are attached to black men as being strong and ma masculine sometimes work in their favor, whereas it always harms black women. And so that's where we get these, these numbers. This, the less than 5% is actually the highest percentage it has. But I mean, of course, ballet is trying to be more exclusive, but at what rate and are we really? This leads into my methods. And so I interviewed 15 black women um, that age between the ages of 18 to 65 that I did in-depth interviews. I kind of did them, they're semi-structured, but then I was kind of open about it because one thing about talking about these experiences, it became such a good conversation. And so I kind of wanted to make sure the participants felt comfortable as well as that the conversation went organically. So we kind of made it more conversational. And then if I felt like anything was missing, then I went back. And um, the way I got into, so the funniest thing is when I went into grad school, the biggest question I got from my advisors was like, well, how are you gonna get access to ballet dancers, especially black ones, if you're saying how low the numbers is? Well, are, well, I, um, I have my own um, personal connections that I have with ballet dancers. I also work for an organization called Brown Girls Do Ballet. And I've been working for American Ballet Theater Summer Intensive for the past four or five years, so. That was a lot of them are very supportive in helping me get access. How I went about it for a lot of the current dancers, I reached out to them through social media. Of course, that's the easiest outlet now of trying to get in contact with participants for any research project. And the more retired dancers, some of them were a little more complicated to get in touch with. So um, that's where I was able to use my connections that I already had to get emails or phone numbers or however else I needed to get in touch with them. And here, so I gave you the, broke, the breakdown of if they were retired and current, then I did the ranking. So I kind of also want to explain that when you look at ballet, you have the core, which is like the kind of like the roles, the little roles that a lot of people have when they're dancing. Then you have soloists, which get some principal roles, but also play in the core. And then you have principal, which is, is the top. And that's when you get a lot of the major roles. And so I also wanted to provide that breakdown as well. So I wanted to show this clip, it's about two minutes, but I felt like it was a good reflection on what I'm moving into, into with my findings. So again, a lot of the experiences with black, with black women in ballet, what I really wanted to hone in on is of course, not so much in this presentation, but in another article that I'm working on is that black dancers are not monolithic, just like black people are not. Um, they have various experiences, they come from various backgrounds, and it's important that we acknowledge that. However, within these spaces, a lot of people within the administrative world, because this whiteness is so embedded, they do not see Black dancers as different. They see them all the same, in which they treat them the same, and they get these same experiences. That's where we get these commonalities of forms of discrimination and whether it's overt or symbolic that I will get into. But for the record, all Black dancers are not the same. And I think that's something that we really also need to touch in on. Point shoes are specifically designed to match your skin tone. To extend your leg line. I found it funny and always wondered why they never chose to match mine. Oh, 
punch. Sorry. I found it funny and always wondered why they never chose to match mine. I was 19 years old the first time I saw another black ballet dancer. I remember that feeling at home in Paris. Unemployed, not knowing if I could dance. I cried. I thought I was the only one fighting. Growing up as a black ballerina was a silent struggle filled with consistent racist comments that you hear from an early age. The assumption was that my body was not made to do ballet. You look like a boy. Your bum is too big. Your hair isn't right. Without representation through your training and sometimes in your career, you have to really believe in yourself that you can achieve your dreams. But I always wondered, what if my skin was lighter, my hair blonder? Would I then be seen as an artist and not as a black person? Teachers constantly encourage me to change my career. I was once told that I could not be cast with all the white dancers from my ballet class because I didn't look feminine enough and that I would look better as a part of the male cast. So I was cast as a male dancer. You should do hip hop, they told me, because you guys are great movers. They said I won't ever have a job in ballet. This industry was not ready for me, not ready for us black people. They exclaimed that if I didn't make my butt disappear, then my teacher will cut it with a kutla. That's a knife they used to cut sugarcane beef on the plantations. I was, I was just fed up of the bullying and mentally exhausted. So throughout, throughout this video, Marie shares um, kind of a few of the overt forms of discrimination, the fatigue that she finally reaches, the racial fatigue of constantly being discrimination, discriminated, and of course, some of the symbolic forms of discrimination, which I will touch on. And so this article came out in 2018 and it talks about how they just now started to make point shoes that reflect darker tones. And of course, as you can see, it says over 2000 um, years later. So in around the early 1800s, it was too risque for dancers to have bare legs. And so in Paris, and so they wanted to create a skin tone, I mean, like a color that would complement the all white ballet company that they had. And so the best color that they felt would um, complement their skin color was ballet pink, which is what we see today. And so that's not to say white people are pink, but it is to say that it was the best color to, uh, to complement their, complement their skin tone and make their lines look long, which is a very, which is one of the benefits and one of those things that are looked for and valued within ballet. And so for, for dancers of darker skin tones, the light colored tights does not complement them as well. It makes them look shorter, it cuts off their lines um, and it doesn't elongate them as well. So. What happens is for a lot of ballet dancers, they either, now things are a little different. So you can probably find tights that are an array of skin tones, but for the longest for dancers, they had to either, they had to dye their own point, their own tights and leotards. And then for their point shoes, they do this thing as you see in the photo, which is called pancaking. And so you take your makeup and you paint your point shoe. Now, these are one of of those again symbolic things that you constantly see and it falls into again trying to navigate this aesthetic labor that is not for you so you're trying when you go you go to a store and of course you can't last minute just grab your point shoes like everyone else or grab your tights because you don't have them that match for you and when you're grabbing these um, point shoes aside from just sewing the ribbon which everyone does you also have to paint your pancake, your point shoes to match. So ballet is already an expensive activity 
the point shoes can range from $80 all the way up. So it's depending on the brand and the style that you like. So on top of that, you're paying for makeup, which makeup is also not a ch cheap thing to buy. And so as you're doing this though, it also, again, puts on this reminder that this face is not for you. They're not in support. And what is also ironic about point shoes is you can get them in an array of colors. So you can get them in red or black, but you can't get them in an array of colors that are considered new. So again, this is trying, but then again, when you're in this space, you're like, well, I'm here, you know, I have this ability to be in this space. So you're not always, so it's one of those things where it's a constant reminder that, okay, this isn't for me because they can't even have point shoes that match my skin tone when I need them. Sometimes you don't, but also tights. So for my participants, a lot of them shared their experience. For India, she just shared kind of like the color. She already, it was kind of natural for her like, oh yeah, like I have to paint them like this color. I finally found this color. Gabrielle shares how it took her some trial and error to try and figure out what color shoe she, and what color uh, makeup she needed and what color tights. So again, money you're using to try and figure out this color, this trial and error when for other people, they don't have to do that. And again, when you have sometimes at these um, dance stores, they'll be like, oh yeah, we have an array of nudes, but of course it's never as darker tone. And then for Cynthia, she shares her, of course, of her performance in the Nutcracker where she had, there was a nude leotard behind her costume and it didn't match her skin tone, but it was too obvious where they couldn't just let her go on stage like that. So instead of figuring out a way to um, make it adjust for her skin color, they just took it out. And she says like, I would put a big rhinestone on my navel. And she kind of talks about how she laughed about that. And also how she had to paint, pancake her shoes as well. Now, the interesting thing about her taking out the leotard is then it re falls into that category of how she's portrayed as a black woman. And then that's where we get into this conversation of controlling images. Um, controlling images are the, is an image of the subordinate group developed by a dominant group that work to justify oppression. Patricia Hill Collins then coins terms um, portraying stereotypes, particularly for Black women. And the one that I kind of focus a lot on throughout this presentation is the Jezebel, which would then be considered like today, like the hip, like the video girl, um, as far as how they're portrayed. So Aisha shares her experience as she was finally given this principal role as the Arabian princess in the Nutcracker, which is a conversation in itself. Um, the style of dance that she, um, that ma majority of the women that I interviewed, they always performed in the Arabian um, section in some way, shape or form when they did the Nutcracker. But she talks about how she finally had this principal role in it. And after the show, which many dancers do, they read the review and one critic says, um, it was just so disturbing to see Aisha up there looking just like little Kim with her dramatic makeup and blonde wig. And she talks about how she can laugh about it now, but she was saying, imagine an adolescent me, like the first time I performed a principal role in the Nutcracker. She talked about how it destroyed her because one, it wasn't true. And it was a veil, as you can see that she's wearing that everyone had to wear. And she talks about how she tried to, she was aware of her darker skin. So she was very, um, cognizant of how she put on her makeup because she knew how it would reflect for on the stage um, and for the audience to see. And then she said like, and the things that were just said were so hurtful. And then to write something that's so opposite as who she is now. Now for black women being in ballet, they are already challenging this controlling image. They are doing a, um, an activity that is considered so graceful, so beautiful, um, so elegant. So they're already challenging that. So then within this space, there's still a way that they're uh, minimized into a controlling image, which as you can see when they were saying up there looking just like little Kim. So as a comparison, you of course chose something that falls under this Jezebel ideology, which whether it's good or bad, you still minimized her to that when she said there were all these other people in st on stage and she was the only one called out. And this kind of goes into, again, the stigma that's already attached to Black women, that they can't be elegant and beautiful and soft and admirable. They always have to be, um, can, they're always considered as strong or anything other than at beautiful and um, admirable. 
So now talking about Eurocentric ideas of beauty and caricaturing um, Black features. So Deborah shares her experience when she was, she was actually guest performing for another company and the artistic director had this African theme in mind. And so he kept wanting, he wanted her to like wear her hair. He's like, I want you to wear your hair crazy. And she said that he wanted her to look very buffoon-like, which was very offensive to her because in her mind, of course, like why would you caricaturize this black ideology that you had? But also of course, that's why you chose me. And she was saying how it was just so opposite of who she was. And of course she danced for New York City Ballet. So the requirements and the aesthetic aesthetic look for ba for uh, New York City Ballet was completely opposite, but she was trying to figure out this way to navigate um, how she felt. But then again, there's this power dynamic. You're talking to a choreographer, so you don't want to um, upset him because that would harm her from keeping her role or a, of course word goes around in ballet community is small so then you're considered this angry black woman you're hard to work with so she was saying that despite the fact that she was so upset she had to put on this form of labor to act you know of course to find a nice way to tell him like uh, I don't know if we should do all that like how trying to navigate her way of doing this performance. Aisha shares more of a bodily, um, a body experience and embodiment where she was dancing for this company and the, the artistic director wanted them all to take their hair down one by one. And Aisha was the only black girl in the group and as everyone was taking their hair down, of course, like for, um, she has tighter curls, tighter curlier hair. So when she took her hair out, her hair went out opposed to just flowing down. And she said that everyone laughed, of course, um, but, she was saying she was so mortified by that, to, to have everyone laughing that it hurt her feelings. But of course, when she was standing there, she had to act strong, but she was saying inside she wanted to cry. So again, it's this thing of performing this emotional labor while you're dealing with this aesthetic labor and this aesthetic requirement that's not fit for you. And again, it goes into marginalizing these black women into this space they are very aware of these controlling images and these stereotypes that are attached to them so they're trying to find a way to navigate them to not perpetuate the stereotypes that are placed on them and a lot of times through going through these overt and um, symbolic forms of discrimination they reach a point of emotional and physical fatigue and for robin she talks about her experience she there's um, a lot of times with ballets and the repertoires there, again, they come from all the way, as I mentioned, back to like the 1600s, a lot of them are codified already. So she was talking about how she was doing this role that there was this role that she knew she has done it so many times. But while she was at this particular company, she reached this point of racial fatigue to the point where she was so broken down by the constant discrimination and racism that she faced in there that when it got to the point she finally got her chance to perform, she said she was with the company for about three years and never got to perform. So when she finally got the chance to perform, she was so drained and had this racial fatigue that to the point where she couldn't, she, she said she physically could not perform. She, her body just wouldn't let her and she knew that was her time to go. And for a lot of ballet dancers, the same thing happens. Andrea shares her experience of dancing with New York City Ballet for over nine years. And um, towards her last couple of years, they, they wanted to record the performance of the Nutcracker. She was playing the lead role in the snowflake um, scene. And the, our, the ballet mistress walked up to her and was like, we can't have you do this role. And when she asked why, the um, ballet mistress looked at her and was like, you know why. And she said at that point, she, want, she left because she knew that they didn't care about her. And again, she also reached this form of racial fatigue. And for a lot of dancers, former dancers have shared their experience in dealing with the um, KKK and many other different forms and stories that can be shared that you just get to the point of experiencing this so much you get tired which is explains the racial the low um, retention in black women that then do get into these companies and so to bring it all um, together I kind of build on Adia Harvey Wingfield's idea of talking about black professionals in the workplace which is very similar again ballet for a lot of these dancers this is their career so they are dealing with this racialized form of gendered and emotional uh, gendered emotional and aesthetic labor that for all these other dances they don't have to deal with they just have the emotional and aesthetic labor they are trying to navigate because again ballet does have this um, weird this power dynamic 
dynamic in which you do always have to perform for your artistic director, your choreographer, anything of that nature. But again, these black dancers have to navigate, okay, how am I gonna find a place in, in a space that's not for me and they're waiting for me to mess up. And so again, many of these ballet dancers were ass assigned roles that reinforce racial stereotypes and controlling images. Um, Black women were forced to conform to a required look that again, it was embedded in whiteness and Eurocentric, side, Eurocentric ideas of beauty. And then just overall, the way these performances were structured in the space, it was a, it's a hostile, it can be a hostile workplace for a lot of Black women. Aside from, like I said, for many, it's very gendered, it can be a very gendered hostile workplace, but on top of that, it's also racialized. So again, I wanted to connect this intersectionality of race and gender when we talk about emotional and aesthetic labor within ballet. And with that being said, I would like to say thank you and open it up for questions. Thank you, Sakani. Um, do you want to stop sharing the screen in case some of the folks do want to show faces and yes. be a part of the conversation? Like we said, you are more than welcome to uh, show your face and be a part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Sakani. As you were, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to sound um, like a mom or a big <laughs> sister, but so proud of your scholarship. It just you, really man. knocked it out of the park. Really great. And I think it lends for like, so I'm gonna open it up to the floor in a minute for folks who may wanna ask questions and our Wegland interns are here as well. So we have Kelly and Daniela who, who can go through the chat and um, check for you. But I'm just curious, I know a lot of folks may be wondering what has been for you the most, perhaps uh, most challenging part of doing this research and or surprising part of doing this research? Because I know there are a lot of things that you hypothesized that were probably, you know, came true, right, to fruition. But what was some of the challenging or surprising things about doing this research for you? I think there were two. So there was more an academic one and a personal one. And I think the academic one was, um, again, I kind of came in with my own ideas that I thought I would see. and as I went through this research, it kind of became more of a grounded theory. So trying to figure out how to adjust in that way and talk about these, like I said, I think it clicked to me to talk about, well, these stories aren't all, I mean, you know, like all black people aren't the same. I think we need to highlight that. And that was something that, you know, for me, I was so, I wanted to be so quick to be like, no, all of us are going through this. So trying to navigate that. And also ironically, the interview process, the first couple interviews I went, I did, they were um, hard. I know it was very cold. They were just kind of answering the questions. And for me, it didn't click for me to really introduce myself because I'm also so private and weird about how I open up to people. And I, it wasn't until one, one of the interviews halfway through, I was like, yeah, because I experienced it. She's like, wait, you, like, you're a dancer. And she completely went back and opened up about things she was not planning on opening up. So trying to be more transparent. And like I said, that's where my interviews changed and I went more conversational. Um, on a personal level, again, I used to be a dancer. So I was able to, a lot of the things that I experienced, I didn't realize where other people were going and what was actually happening. I was getting pushed out of ballet without realizing. I thought these, um, my teachers had the best interest for me and I didn't realize that's what was happening. And so hearing those stories became more, that's what made this research more important, more personal for me, because I was kind of learning like, okay, I was never alone in this process. And I think the one part that really got to me is the ballet dancer that I had discovered when I was younger. I was so obsessed with her. I finally got to interview her. Mm -hmm. I was so excited. And I thought she, you know, I've always been like, she's so perfect. She, um, what, she's actually, it's Aisha, I can tell you. And she, I don't know if any of you have seen Center Stage. It's like a 90s ballet movie. It's really good. But she was the stunt devils for Zoe Zodana in it. Mm -hmm. So I just always thought she was the most perfect thing. And I sat in front of her doing this interview and she just broke down and she was telling me how ballet broke her down so much to the mm -hmm. point where she didn't see herself as beautiful. And it was so eye-opening to me because I'm looking at her thinking she's the most perfect thing. So um, that was probably one of those challenging things, trying to figure out how to deal with that, um, deal with the personal things that they were telling me and how that affected me. 
Yeah, I mean, I can I can only imagine because I know about your, you know, dance and cheer th from the time that you're quite really young, right? I mean, it's been kind of your life journey and to turn this into an area of work that you really love and that you can contribute to the field is just incredible. Um, okay, I, I don't want to hog the conversation. So I do want to open it up to those who would like to participate in the conversation. If you have any comments or questions or thoughts, um, I welcome you to contribute and you can unmute yourself. I believe you can unmute your own mic if you like. So uh, I, have, I have a question, doctor. Okay, if you could introduce, uh, Gennaro, if you can just introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name's Renato. Um, I, I'm a third year on Cal Poly, so I'm a, soci I'm a sociology major, so this is my alley, kind of. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you did briefly go into um, some institutional racism when it comes to the work, and I know your studies cover <clears throat> 18 to 65, but would you say that it's really present in the sculpting minds that are below 18 and yeah. how would how could they combat that if they were to become more aware like, like let's say 12 to 12 to 18 you know where they can have some contribution contribution right that's a great question um that's actually what i wanted to look at to see like the disconnect because Anytime I talk to people, they're always like, yeah, I did ballet, I wanted to. And you see so many like young black dancers and then all of a sudden, again, when you look at the numbers, it's not the same. Um, and it starts early. I have watched um, working, like I said, I worked for America for a summer intensive and the language that's used at an early age. I've watched some of the directors tell one of the girls, they use kind of coded language, of course, to mask what they're really saying. But this, um, one of the, teachers was like told one of the girls like you're too muscular you need to thin out mm -hmm. and so that's one of those words of telling these dancers that they're too big or again they are too muscular and they want to have this more fit this um image this the idea of being thin which again that's one of those things that's in general but for black dancers it is this thing like okay well the body type they're always considered always having the same body type so it's one of those conversations how can you start it does start back then of course um how can we combat it i think it's just being more aware i mean again i was in a space where i didn't realize what was being said was a problem and many of the dancers i spoke with didn't realize so it's addressing that and i think the biggest thing is we have to talk to the administrative. I mean, it's kind of hard. These dancers are just here to dance. So if we don't address the administration early on and how in the language they use for these dancers, then we're just, you know, the same thing's gotta be perpetuated over and over. So it's definitely addressing and changing the institution. Gotcha, that makes sense. So would you, would you, um, would you consider it um, just the like, the educational racism, everything that goes on um, is that they try and weed out, you know, said black performers and all, all of the, the racial groups that they don't want in the older industry. Yes. So like um, even in the clip and this again was something that happened is they'll tell a lot of dance like you should be in hip hop like you're a great mover or another big one is modern dance. So they'll say you're a great modern dancer. And so Again, what happens is you're told these things, but then you're also, that's where representation matters. Um, so you're seeing these dances and you're like, okay, well, that is true. I see all the black dancers in modern or in hip hop. So that must be where I need to be, not knowing that this has been an institutional way to structure them, a lot of black dancers out. And that's why, again, representation matters. And Misty Copeland, when she, um, she actually became the first black um, principal ballet dan dancer at American Ballet Theater in 2015. So that's how we're seeing how slow the process is. But seeing her be so vocal about race and ballet has been one of those things that allowed us so many dancers to come out. So even former dancers that were like, well, I didn't have the, you know, the support or, you know, again, it's your career. They didn't feel comfortable putting or they were silent so early. They didn't feel comfortable to share that. Um, that's why, but now that we're seeing it, it's like, okay, well now we can speak out and now we can figure out a way to actually address and call out the racism that happens because for so long they couldn't. I mean, actually um, one of my participants talks about how she 
filed a discrimination case against American Ballet Theater. And ironically, you cannot find that case anywhere. Um, she sent me the paperwork. And then the only place you can find like a little paragraph about it, I had to go to the New York City Library and they wouldn't even send it to me. I had to wait till I went to New York to see that little place that talks about the discrimination um, case that happened, which um, ironically is kind of the start when she filed the discrimination case, she won. And instead of asking for money, she told them they needed to have a certain amount of um, black dancers admitted into the school, which then followed into where Misty Copeland came in. Wow, I mean, like in terms of the systematic racism, we know that, you know, I think for those of us, especially in sociology, I would hope, and with everything that's happening in our society that um, the systematic racism and anti-blackness is very real and very much alive since forever. Uh, but I think in terms of the world of dance and ballet in particular, you intersect it with the issues of elitism and classism combined with the racism. And I, I do want you to kind of mention, um, most of your respondents appear to be women. And in terms of the gender divide, is that is the pressure or are the pressures the same for male ballet dancers or is your focus primarily on women? Yeah, um, as I open into my dissertation, I am also including men. I started off focusing primarily on women just because the numbers are significantly lower because um, like women have to, perform this, uh, again, this sense of beauty that Black men didn't have to. Um, and um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, but for Black men, a lot of times, so one that comes to mind is I remember I had the opportunity to actually interview Arthur Mitchell, who um, is the founder of Dance Theater of Harlem. And he talks about his experience. And he was like, yeah, I know. He had this lead role for New York City Ballet. And the highlight of it was his dark skin on um, in com combined with the um, female leads um, white skin. So it made her look more elegant being dancing with this black man, be man because of the stigma of them being, you know, so masculine and so tough. And so that's how the, the conversation sometimes shift. Now, again, for all black men, they don't always have, um, the same experience but a lot of times it's this they go off the stigma of black men looking so strong so of course also their um their masculinity is never challenged because mm -hmm. it's hyper it's hyper sexualized or hyper um they're hyper masculine um so that's kind of why but i am like i said i want to get into that because that's a problem in itself and so mm -hmm. for my dissertation i will definitely kind of talk about the gender differences because again, for black women, they are not viewed as being feminine and beautiful right. and elegant. Right, it, it just appears to be, you know, very much like Arlie Hochschild's work on gender is that you're adding on to that. And in terms yeah. of, it's like the performative of the performative, right? Like, like women have to have this performative demeanor um, and in intellectual spaces often assumed incompetent or presumed incompetent. And in the, in the field of dance is that, is that presumption of, not fitting that aesthetic mold that ballet, you know, seeks out. Um, Brianne Davila was saying that your work can inform bias trainings in dance. And I, I absolutely, I think this is something that can definitely inform in dance and sports. I think a lot of the same similar aesthetics, but especially in dance because of that aesthetic appeal that you talk about. Um, Jose, did you want to ask your question directly or would you like me to read your question? Uh, I, I could uh, ask the question directly. Hi, uh, great, awesome work. I love your presentation. Uh, so I wanted to know, did the dancer's uh, status, their rank, uh, influence their experience? And also, what about the status or prestige of the dance group? Mm -hmm. Is this something yeah. that you have been exploring in terms of, you know, you, you talk about race, gender, but also it seems that there's like class status or prestige towards you know, the rankings and the space that they work at. Yes, definitely. And so that's kind of where that conversation with um, Dance Theater of Harlem comes into play. It's not considered this top ranked company when it very much is. Um, Dance Theater of Harlem, along with Alvin Ailey, are probably one of the biggest companies that tour. But of course, because of the way we view race, it's not always um, placed in that top ranking. But within these companies like American Ballet Theater and New York City Ballet, which um, I primarily focus on, um, the ranking, 
The ranking does matter, but one thing about it is they still experience the same thing. So one thing with Misty Copeland, I mean, she had danced with the company for over 10 years before she even got um, moved up and it was one of those things you also then have to question like well and she was considered a prodigy coming in so a lot of people knew she had this talent that many people didn't have so why did it take so long for her to become principal same thing with one of the male principal dancers right now I have been watching his career for a very long time and he would be and this is where it's like this labor that goes outside of ballet that a lot of non um white people have to get this racialized labor that they do within their occupation, right? They get put on these diversity roles and all these other things, but they don't always get compensated for it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened with uh, Calvin Royale that dances for American Ballet Theater. He was always given these um, principal roles without, of course, the label. And that matters because pay matters, the ranking in general, how much work you put in. So on top of him getting these principal roles without the title, he then was playing all these other core roles and he was performing every night. And so the breakdown breakdown of how that works too is a, another conversation, but he was, um, he just now um, that in September was finally moved to principal, but for the longest he was doing these roles without the compensation of doing that role. Um, but in general, they do all ex- still experience the same, you know, it's um, forms of discrimination, but it's, it is interesting to look at how long it takes for certain dancers to become principal or to move up opposed to others. Yeah, I mean, not, not to mention that so many folks don't even realize that there are black ballet dancers, right? You know, exactly. and, and um, Tracy had a question, Tracy Canada. I'm not sure Tracy if Sekani answered your question based on her response previously, but she said, I have a similar question. How does the hierarchy that's inherent in the ballet play in, in the experiences you've learned about? Yeah, um, so I actually didn't fully, you know, I kind of touched on it, but so essentially the principal roles, they get paid the most. And so because they get the lead roles, they only perform, they don't perform every night. Uh, so they a lot of times they get these roles so like if like when you see like the um, the kind of like the nights of performances you see who's starring that's the nights they perform they don't do any other role just the prince soloists will do um, a variety of roles sometimes they'll get more um, they'll get roles of about four people or so or they'll also do core roles if they need to and they get paid a little bit more Um, still not much. And then the core members, they perform almost every night. They probably get only a few nights off and they're always just playing little roles within. So they don't have as much leeway. They don't have as much breaks. And then again, they don't play these. um, um, They don't get these professional roles. They also don't get paid paid much. And which is also another conversation of the pay that these dancers get. They put in so much work. Mm -hmm. These dancers are full-time contracted workers, which is also where my work kind of goes into um, occupations, but they're full-time workers. They're working pretty much, they work six days a week for over eight hours, and that's not including shows. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, again, your body's getting all this work, and you're not getting paid. A lot of them make well under $40,000 a year. Like, that's like, maybe principal roles. And then Misty is, of course, the anomaly because she's considered a celebrity, but um, they're doing all this work for minimum pay. I think Winnie Dong, Winnie, do you have a question? You have your hand up? I think Dr. Lax did too. I can't tell. Yeah, I've, I was going to just ask a little bit about, um, so first of all, I, I thought you really did a great job of also drawing these parallels to things we see in things like sports, for example, like with stacking, where black athletes were always put into certain roles and then not allowed into other roles. And then that then like the sprinting versus long distance running is a great example that black athletes get funneled into sprinting and track and field and white athletes get funneled into long distance running. And then everyone goes, well, black people are just better at sprinting and white people are just better at longer distances. And it's like, no, but I was thinking also in terms of moving up, given the shortage of ballet dancers or by POC ballet dancers, I would assume that then you also see that at all the levels, all the way up at the choreographers, the donors, all the people who are involved around the world of ballet. And I wondered if you could also talk about sort of that larger impact of not just being the only black ballet dancer, but maybe the only black person walking into those, this entirely enormous white space that also has 
this higher this hierarchy outside of the dance itself that is heavily European? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. And so not only is this hierarchy outside, so the administration, which for my um, dissertation, that's actually who I'm planning to interview as well to get their, ex how mm -hmm. they view these black dancers. Um, but the administration is typically heavily white and male, which is also another mm -hmm. conversation because especially during the time of the Me Too movement, a lot of dancers were coming out of how they have been um, sexually assaulted or, you know, dealt with some type of experience when it came to trying to, you know, like move up and, in positions and how these artistic directors and choreographers manipulated them in that sense. Um, so when it comes to, of course, as well racially, it's this still I, these holding these ideals of whiteness and wanting to preserve this um, space. So that's the tricky thing about ballet. For so long, they didn't, they couldn't, they weren't pressured to talk about diversity or open up about diversity because it's so exclusive. It's so exclusive and so small. And again, it's been predominantly white. There's so many people I talk to and they're like, yeah, I've never been to a ballet because I assume the tickets are so expensive and I couldn't get one. And so by maintaining the hierarchy or like the administration and keeping them white and male, you're still perpetuating again this patriarchy um, and still holding on to these racialized ideas of like these dancers can't be in this space. And um, which I mean, I've also heard when I was just working for the um, for the ballet company that for the summer intensive, I heard um, conversations go like, well, I mean, they just, I can't see them. I can't see black people being, you know, like making it into these companies or a lot of talk around Misty Copeland. Um, not really being able to be in that space. She doesn't deserve to be in that space. So a lot of times, again, it's just maintaining their ballet is one of those places that can slide under the radar and you can maintain this elite, this exclusive white um, space, which Misty is challenging by bringing ballet to the mainstream and really bringing this conversation to light. I think Tashana has a, a question. Do you want to ask it or would you like me to read it? Well, I can ask it. Um, hey, Sakani. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> in person and forever. I, I know. When she, when she was applying to grad school. Um, I wanted to ask if you noticed any differences in uh, the experiences of those that you, uh, of your participants in, their, in, in regards to their skin tone. Like the folks who were lighter skinned have a different, a very different experience than those who may um, consider themselves darker skinned. Um, dancers? Yes, that is a very good question. That is something that's very, um, it's something very pressing that I am planning on talking about, but colorism takes place. So um, when we talk about, like, if you look at like American Ballet Theater, the Black women that are in there are fair skin. And so a lot of people, there is also a lot of talk with Misty Copeland and that she's safe because on stage, she's able to kind of blend in. But what also happens is they feel comfortable. Not, I mean, Misty Copeland doesn't get too much, but a lot of former dancers that have been fair skinned talk about their experience in which they were asked to wear lighter makeup to make them look lighter. Um, so colorism does have, because it's a safer way to bring black dancers in without drawing too much commotion. And what's also ironic is there are dark, so in, I didn't get too much into these principal roles. So we, there's a very few um, amount of black women that have been in principal roles. The very first one didn't come until the, um, the end of the eighties. And then we had our second first principal, um, black principal dancer in 1990, which um, was Lauren Anderson and she's darker skinned. So that was a big conversation of having this darker skinned woman in this role, because again, that's when that conversation was really heavy of tights and point shoes needing to match her skin tone with a lot of lighter skin women you can again still find ways to get away with it ask them to lighten their skin and it's ironic because there's a dancer named Michaela Day Prince and she is amazing and she's always used this is again where we talk about this labor that black women um, have to experience and it goes into colorism as well but she's always used for advertisements in the United States like I think she was the face of Chase at one point um, she's always interviewed but 
no one hired her in the United States. There's also a lot of talk that she plays like this. She actually, um, and this is here or there, this is just me talking, but people would argue that she's actually better, a better fit than Misty Copeland, um, which again is putting two black women against each other. But needless to say, she has the ability to be a dancer here because she's used used for advertisement, but no one would hire her. Um, why? Because of her skin tone. So she dances actually in, I think she dances for Dutch National Ballet, mm -hmm. but she's always, especially around um, Black History Month, she's always back in, back in here. So you really don't, you don't see too many darker skin dancers dance for these major companies. Majority of them dance for like Dance Theater of Harlem, um, or they have to go into Alvin Ailey, which isn't a problem, but Alvin Ailey is more of a modern dance style. Thank you. Great questions. Um, I, you know, we're out of time. If we have anyone with pressing questions that you would like to ask, I can open up for one more question or comment. Uh, Amanda, do you have your hand up? Hi, um, my name is Amanda. I'm a master's student at Brock University in Ontario. Um, I'm also doing my research on a similar topic, looking at um, Black ballerinas in, um, in terms of sp um, spatiality. So I was wondering how this emotional and aesthetic labor differs in Black spaces, such as um, the Dance Theater of Harlem. If you've seen any difference in terms of your dancers' um, experiences? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of the dancers I interviewed danced for like um, American Ballet Theater specifically, just because that's where I had access. But I do have a few friends that dance for um, Dance Theater of Harlem. And I did talk to a few people that have passed through Dance Theater of Harlem. And so when it comes to the emotional and aesthetic labor, I think symbolically it's more of a home space because uh, Dance Theater of Harlem is very aware and makes sure they provide tights and point shoes that match the skin tone. But colorism is very prominent within Dance Theater of Harlem. That has been the biggest conversation that goes on, but sometimes people don't highlight it just because of course it's one of those like, well, a lot of black people will like consider just this end house thing. Like we don't wanna already divide within the space, but colorism takes place when it comes to who gets principal roles. Um, one of my um, participants did dance for Dance Theater of Harlem for some time. And she said, actually, she's like, the crazy thing is when I left New York City Ballet and went to Dance Theater of Harlem, I thought it would be an easier space. But she's like, the colorism was so embedded there too. I had to work hard as a dark skinned woman just to really be seen when I was asked to go. You know, I came from New York City Ballet to Dance Theater of Harlem. I thought it would be seen different, but because of my dark skin, I was constantly like out out um shined or you know given role like missed out roles just because of my color just because I was darker skinned so it's more so of a colorism conversation when you talk about dance theater of Harlem and that again is another form of emotional aesthetic labor that they're dealing with trying again you're still fighting against this idea of who's closest to this Eurocentric idea of beauty yeah, thanks to Connie. I mean, I think one of the things that Faye mentioned is that, you know, we are also proud of our alumni who was also a McNair scholar and Winnie is on here as well and really encouraging our students and other folks on other campuses if you have a McNair program to support your students at McNair. Uh, and I also want to give gratitude. I, I keep forgetting to do this. I have to be better about thanking um, the land that we are on, on indigenous land. You know, we we are from the Tongva tribe in the Pomona area. And I don't know if any of you on your chat, if you would like to kind of share where you're from. I know that Amanda's from Ontario, I think Canada, right? Ontario, Canada. And so if you have, I could talk about your first peoples or indigenous communities that um, the tribes that you're from, you know, feel free to chat on there. Uh, Daniela and Kelly, I have to thank them. They're my right and left hand. I always say as a Weglin intern, Sekani was also my Weglin intern back in the day. So it's, it's so great to have generations of Weglin intern. Um, so Daniela and Kelly have been working really hard and they'll be sending all of you a survey, post talk survey, just to get your insight and input. So that way we can hear from you and to get a sense of what you thought about what we did today with Sekani. And, you know, we didn't invite you because it is Black History Month, but I'm, it's inter interesting that I remember, yes, it is Black History Month and it's, you know, quite fitting that we have one of the best Black sociologists out there, you know, giving a talk on for our department. 
but this definitely won't be the last time. So um, thank you so much all, to all of you who took the time out of today to come and visit and spend this hour with us. We show great gratitude to all of you for being here, but especially to Sakani, who is doing some really wonderful work, groundbreaking work, getting in depth into the field of ballet and especially with uh, black dancers that I don't think any of us really had an entree to. So it's gonna be a really eye-opening dissertation and soon to be book. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sikhani. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, bye everyone. All right. So what is um, left for you? Um, let me end the recording here.